Well, howdy there, Reaction Channel. It's been a minute, but I'm back. All right, we got a bunch to get into here today. Tom Lee, everybody's favorite bowl, just went on CNBC two hours ago. I want to react to what he was talking about here in this video today, okay? Then we're getting to this video, how to position in the market following last week's sell-off. So we'll react to that one, speak about that one. Then we're going to react to this little two-minute clip. Tesla and Apple remain the biggest laggers in the MAG7. We're going to speak about if Tesla and Apple stocks are a buy here, why or why not. Then I want to get into NVIDIA. Here's why Bank of America maintains a buy rating. NVIDIA stock's been kind of floundering for about the last, let's call it two months or so, at least some, the last month and a half, two months. So a lot of people are wondering, like, is the stock done now at this point in time? Is it priming to get ready for another big rally. So we'll speak about that in this video. And then a completely random last video I want to react to is IRS commissioner. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think this would be important. We'll talk about a few little tax tips I have for you guys to maybe save some money uh, out there when you're investing in those sorts of things. So hopefully that can bring you some value in this one. And if you didn't know, it's finally here, folks. I've been talking about it for the last two weeks. Today's the big sale. We got 10 hours left here. It was going to be the pinned comment down there to get access before the sale ends. 69 bucks. That's usually $125 tier. It's my highest Patreon tier I have. Access to my number one course ever, Become a Master of Stock Market. Access to see the moves I'm making each week, plus access to the Patreon Discord chat. It's the highest tier I have that will be pinned comment down there to get access to that. Enjoy that, guys, and get it before it ends, okay? All right, let's get into this. About taking things like, say, a job print or CPI and arguing that it's uh, an opportunity if there is a dip. Is it a harder call? when it does involve geopolitics? Uh, it's definitely a harder call because the scope of, a, of you know, the path this, you know, this escalation can take place is unknown. But at the same time, uh, we can look at sort of past episodes and past war instances or conflicts and understand how markets react and where positioning is. And I think that's what's giving us some confidence today that there's a lot less leverage now and I think the Fed's in a very different position where the Fed could be supportive. And, and that's why I think as uncertain as it feels right now, I, I think this dip will be bought. Does it create downside risk for your year end target, let's say? Uh, you know, I think when you move beyond the one month, even three months or even six month time frames, I, I don't think that these actually affect the trajectory because, you know, the drivers of our year end target are this recovery in corporate profits, you know, the upturn in, in business confidence measured by ISM, the fact that consumer leverage is still quite low and that monetary policy is actually supportive of the business cycle. So I think these things all... Yeah, I, okay, I got to push back against Tom Lee here, my, my fellow bull, okay? Listen, you know, he keeps talking about consumer leverage is low. That's just not right. Confidence measured by ISM, the fact that consumer leverage is still quite low... I just don't agree with that based upon the data. We might be looking at two different data. I do not believe that consumer leverage is low. I also don't think it's as epically bad as the bears make it out to be, okay? So I think Tom Lee's version of where consumer credit's at right now, and I think the bears uh, – like image of consumer credit right now. I think they're both inaccurate. I think we're somewhere in the middle. I do not think consumer leverage is low right now uh, based upon the data, based upon the facts. And I also don't think it's you know certainly some insane number. You know, people want to point out credit card debt. It's higher than it's ever been. But guess what? Almost every year, it's higher than it's ever been. The only time usually credit card debt goes down is if you're in a massive recession because then people can't get loans and those sorts of things. But in any sort of normal economy, Credit card debt goes up year after year after year, 2017 and 18 and 19. That's the way it goes, okay? Only time you usually see it go down is when you're in a big recession. That monetary policy is actually supportive of the business cycle. So I think these things all are still at play between now and year end. And, you know, I think our 5,200 target is, is actually is too low, but it, I think it's still too early for us to raise our target as well. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, I read your note over the weekend, I cited it. A lot Stocks will ultimately emerge higher after de-risking. Tax-related selling is already in place. Expect a possible bottom turning this week. Now, something to do keep in mind, right? Today's April 15th, tax day, right? The thing that's important to remember is the famous saying in the stock market, sell in May and go away. And so some people could already be, you know, selling out of some stocks, kind of expecting a volatile, tough summer. And summertime, many times, you got to understand, is actually a great time to buy stocks. 
just because the stock market is downtrending in summer doesn't mean you shouldn't be buying stocks. It's actually usually the best time to buy stocks. You know, and there's other months that are great for the stock market. November many times, December, January. Uh, I believe March is usually a pretty good month for, for stocks, if I recall. But, you know, if you think about buying, right, maybe those are good months to sell. Usually you want to buy when the market's weaker. And usually in the summertime, you get a lot of weakness in the market. It does rest on this idea that the Fed is in a very different mode. And as you referenced, they're sort of in easing mode. But the story, Tom, has been that they are not going to be able to ease so easily or so quickly. And today's retail sales data only adds fire fuel to that fire. So I do wonder how much of your thesis depends on the Fed cutting this year. Uh, Sarah, I think it's important for the Fed to be dovish this year. Um, and, and in terms of how many cuts they do, I know there's going to be a lot of debate about, well, is it three cuts or is it two or one? But it's really going to be the reasons why they make fewer cuts. If the economy is resilient and inflation is uh, not accelerating, so they end up doing even as little as zero cuts, that's, that's actually quite bullish because, one, the Fed still has a lot of firepower to make future cuts, and it just shows you the economy is handling higher rates pretty well. I mean, I think it would speak really well for equities if, if the Fed made fewer cuts, but for the right reasons. Talk to the extent, sorry. So that's an important part. That's an important part I think a lot of people still aren't understanding. They want the Fed to cut so bad. They think that's going to be great news, those sorts of things. <laughs> listen, listen. Look at history. What does history tell you? When the Fed starts cutting, usually means recession's coming. You know, you can look at so many, look at the past 20, 30, 40 years, and you're going to find almost every single time the Fed starts cutting, a recession happened very shortly after. So if anything, like, you should hope the Fed doesn't cut anytime soon, right? That means we're, we're staying in a very strong economy. That means the Fed's worry is inflation. That means the Fed's worry is too strong of an economy, right, that's producing this inflation, too many jobs, which is causing a wage price spiral. If all of a sudden the Fed has to start worrying about deflation, you know why that's going on? It's because you're in a recession at that point in time. Last time we really have seen deflation, you have to go back to, you know, a uh, great financial crisis. You know, we had deflation uh, in 2009, right? Ask people how the economy was in 2009. Ask people how corporate earnings were. Ask people how the stock market was in 2009, right? 2009 is when the market finally bottomed. It was, it was nasty. Thesis depends on, obviously, earnings coming through. We're at the beginning of earnings season. What are you looking for both now and through the back half of next year in terms of S&P earnings and growth rate? Well, um, earnings in the, in the fourth quarter that was reported three months ago came in close to 8% above expectations. That's already flowed through into what we expect for 2025. Um, first quarter's already looking pretty good. You know, more than 80% are beating. So I, I think our 2025 earnings, which is officially 260, and that was 8% earnings growth, is probably low. It's looking like it's going to end up being closer to 270, maybe 275. You know, that's a $15 higher earnings for next year just because of the strength of earnings we're seeing now. So I think profits are coming in pretty well. I mean, inflation's cooling, but companies are still finding operating leverage. So there, there's something a little troubling I've seen out there. I, I saw Carmex stock uh, cross the board there, right? And, and this could weigh on Tesla, which we're going to speak about Tesla in this video, okay? Here's what I, I witnessed in Arizona over the weekend, and, and here's what I witnessed on my drive back uh, to, to Vegas, okay? So when I was in Arizona, went by just this massive amount of car dealerships. When I was on the west side, this is kind of like, let's call it, this is between like, I think 83rd Ave and like 91st Ave and Bell Road. If you're from Arizona, you know that area. If you're not, you, you don't know what I'm talking about, and that's fine. Just moral of the story is this is just a massive car dealership area. You've got Ford, you got Chevy, You've got Volkswagen, you've got Audi, you've got Mercedes-Benz, you've got all the big auto manufacturers. They're all on this particular road, okay? And I'm, I'm driving by looking at the lots, and they are as jam-packed as jam-packed can possibly get with vehicles. I haven't seen it like that in a long time, if ever. I could not believe how much inventory was sitting on those parking lots. It was ridiculous. I went by the Jeep lot, and I'm just like, how many Jeeps do they hope to sell? Like, that's insane. And I'm just looking, and I'm like, dude, that's ridiculous. Like, if I was running that dealership, I would just be like, how are we going to move all these freaking vehicles? This is insane, okay? And then, coming back to Vegas, I went by all the dealerships that are there off the 215. If you know where I'm talking about, you know where I'm talking about, right? And 
uh, you know, like there's almost all the dealerships you could possibly imagine right there on that stretch of the 215. And I'm looking at those lots. And, and two years ago, those lots were near empty. I mean, they had hardly any inventory on them two years ago. And I'm going by them now, and they are just jam-packed like a can of sardines. And so this leads into, I think, some issues that are going to be coming for some of these automakers where I think it's going to be difficult for them to move units because they got to sell into the dealership network, right? But the dealerships, to me, look... Like I said, the, the most packed I've seen them certainly in at least five years, if not I've, than I've ever seen. I can't even believe it. And if you work, if there's anybody watching this that works in the, the dealership, you know, <laughs> you got a lot of inventory to move out there. You, you're going to need a lot of people to buy a lot of cars. And this leads into Tesla, right? Tesla. We know, obviously, uh, it's been a weaker environment, right? But the one, the one kind of worrisome thing out there that's out of their hands is man, I feel like these dealerships are going to have to do a lot of discounting over the next six to 12 months to move inventory. And I think I think there might be a little bit of desperation that will breed in over this next six to 12 months when it comes to these dealerships, right? Which is going to put more kind of downward pressure on pricing. I think Tesla and, and you know, Musk and the whole team over there at Tesla, I think they've gotten out in front of this whole situation, right? Because they sell direct to consumers, so they feel it before, whereas a lot of these other guys, they just sell into the network and they just drop vehicles to the, to the network, right? Uh, that's going to start hitting them, I think, this year, whereas Tesla, everybody kind of got to see it got hit last year, right? So we'll see how this shakes out. But, man, I was like, geez, that's a lot of units to move there. Holy smokers, that's no jokers. How do position the markets following last week's sell-off? Uh, the action that we saw in the, in the tech sector last week, how do you see investors or how do you believe that investors should play it going forward? I think it's nervousness just given the overall market, geopolitical, you know, and everything going on with the 10 year. But look, I think it's a get out the popcorn movement. I think this is going to be a robust tech earnings season next few weeks. We view this more of a golden buying opportunity, given what we see in cybersecurity, the AI revolution and digital marketing and advertising that's trending ahead expectations. And that's our view. This is not the time to run. It's actually the time to own the winners. All right. So Dan Ives is bullish right now on tech, saying this is a buying opportunity. Uh, Does that Steph, come as a how do you see all this? I mean, we've got earnings tech. season coming up. We're seeing earnings expectations continue to fall. Right now, how do you view the action that we saw on the market last week? Um, as someone who obviously advises clients, how are you advising people to play the markets this week? I think it's pretty remarkable, Frank, that we're only down 2.5% from all-time highs in the S&P 500. And in the past 16 months, we're up 33%. We've had to deal with hotter inflation, an unknown Fed, um, bank earnings on Friday, which weren't great. But I don't think, by the way, they were as bad as they, they reacted. But nevertheless, it wasn't good. We have the, the geopolitical issues. I think the reason we're bouncing back today is because... Israel was actually pretty successful um, in terms of shooting down 99% of the missiles and drones that came at them. We don't know what their game plan is, and I think that's the reason we're going to stay volatile. But I want to step back for half a second and say, why exactly is inflation hotter than that's expected? Insane. That's insane. What a flex. Inflation is hotter than expected because we've had an unprecedented amount of fiscal stimulus in the system for the past four years, and that is acting as a nice tailwind for the economy. We're growing above trend, and that will lead to better than expected earnings. And I agree that technology with um, with Dan that technology earnings will be good, but the thing is. Other sectors' earnings will be good, and some of those sectors have really, you know, fallen by the wayside. And I think there's your opportunity. All right, so you're saying earnings are going to be good, Steph? But I mean, looking at communication services, the estimate is for it to be basically 29 percent higher. Something important, and I spoke about this on the main channel here recently, is I have to push back against my fellow bulls here. Okay, listen. The bulls keep trying to make in excuses for inflation month after month. Oh, it's only this. Oh, it's only this. We've been doing that for like a year and a half now at this point in time, if not two years. And I'm about done with it. Okay. At the end of the day, CPI is still too high. Okay. We obviously got to get down into the twos. We're in like mid threes right now. And so I just get very frustrated that, you know, we keep making excuses. Oh, it's only this. Oh, it's only that. At some point, you just got to stop making excuses and just be like, we still got an inflation problem. It hasn't been defeated yet. We're doing much better than we were doing two years ago, but it's still a problem. Year over year, um, basically tech 21% higher year over year. Do you think it can live up to those lofty expectations, even as we more broadly see earnings expectations decline? 
I think you're going to see 8 to 10 percent growth in the S&P 500. I think technology will actually deliver, but they are overowned and there are higher expectations than something like energy, which should see growth in earnings. Uh, we, sh we should see uh, industrials do very well, 15 to 20 percent organic growth, free cash flow. Uh, and I think you're also going to see good numbers in the materials and in some of the discretionary. I'm, I'm most excited um, this week actually for D.R. Horton to report because I think housing is on the mend. And I think that's a place where you want to be investing as well. Housing's on the mend. Hold your horses for just a flip and flapjack in a moment, okay? Almost all the home builders are at all-time highs. <laughs> or very, very close to all-time highs. You, I, don't, I, don't, I think there's a view of like, oh, housing uh, is getting better. Like, how are all the home builders near all-time highs <laughs> at this point in time? Like, this is a bunch of baloney. The, the fact is, all these home builders have been making ridiculous profits. They're continuing to make ridiculous profits in the short term. Short term meaning over the next year or so, right? When the recession hits, whenever that is, whether that's 2025, 2026, whatever, these guys are all going to get hit heavily in that situation because you'll see inventory rise considerably for, let's call it, regular residential properties. And foreclosures will go up massively, short sales, those sorts of things. But for right now, they they are in their great times. Like, this is it's never been better for these home builders. This is it for them. All right, Dan, I'm going to come over to you. Obviously, again, earnings season's kicking off. Um, you're looking at the cybersecurity sector for opportunities, but it's kind of a head scratcher. Ever since Palo Alto Networks reported back in February, the entire cyber sector has taken a pretty steep decline. Do you believe that's going to see a turnaround during earnings season? I mean, why would you want to buy cybersecurity stocks right now when they've been under so much pressure? Yeah, look, I think this is the ma massive disconnect. I think this is going to be a turnaround for the ages for cybersecurity, Zscaler, CrowdStrike. We're actually strong buyers of Palo Alto here in terms of the transformation they're making. And, and right now, I think this is going to be one of the biggest subsectors of tech, especially as you have all... But what are you seeing that the market's out. not seeing, Dan? Because everyone's taking what happened with Palo as ultimately the, just the start of a shot across the bow negative. We see the opposite, which is why right now, Frank, this is a pound the table time on cybersecurity, in our opinion, and that's how we're hand-holding investors through it. All right, so you're hand-holding investors through it. Steph, I, I want to come back to you. Something you've been looking at is the money and money market funds. Um, Ooh, that's interesting. I can't wait to get into this. Uh, real quick here, let me say there's a group of stocks that I actually think is an attractive trade. Now, am I going to personally try to trade these stocks in the short term? Absolutely not. That's not my name of the game. But let's just put a trader hat on me and say I was trying to trade a group of stocks, swing trade it. I actually believe energy stocks are positioned pretty decent until what? Until the first rate cut. Once rate cuts happen, I would be looking to get out of energy stocks. But like I said, I'm not looking to play that at all. I'm focused on long-term investing. But if we want to play hypothetical games, I think energy is pretty well positioned for the next, uh, I would say, few months here at this point in time. Well, right now, according to ICI, there's about $6 trillion in there. But in April, about $31 billion came out of those money market funds. How do you see that in, impacting 30, tech investing, but just the markets overall? $31 billion out of $6 trillion plus? Come on, that's like literally nothing. You know what's interesting, Frank, like is nothing. Larry Fink of BlackRock on Friday said that there was $9 trillion in money market m numbers. So I, he must have the most updated figures because I actually also th thought it was about $6 trillion. Wow. Well, it doesn't even matter. Six or nine, there's a heck of a lot of money on the sidelines that, okay, I get it. It's getting 4 or 5% in interest so you can sleep well at night, but you're going to get much more in terms of total returns in the S&P 500. And that's actually also what Sh uh, Schwab, their management team, has said. They look at cash balances on a month-to-month -month basis, and those numbers have been coming out of money markets and cash on the sidelines going into the S&P 500 because there's this fear of missing out. And if I'm right, and we have better than expected earnings, and we have a broadening out in earnings, that's all the more reason why you do want to be buying in on these dips. Yeah, but stop it. Just stop it, okay? Listen, $31 billion out of $6 trillion plus is nothing. Talk to me when... 310 billion come out. Then we say, okay, 310 billion out of 6 trillion. Okay, that's a pretty good amount of money. 31 billion out of over 6 trillion dollars is literally nothing right now. Okay, so yeah, I wouldn't quite call that FOMO. When we start seeing 100 billion, several hundred billion, then that's a whole different story. All right, Dan, I'm going to give you last word. I know you're bullish on cybersecurity. Give us your other top picks for right now. Ooh, top picks. Yeah, so overall, look, we, we'd be Microsoft to me from a cloud perspective. Microsoft. These are going to be 
jaw dropper numbers in terms of what we see there. Google's another one. Some of the parts, AI could add 30 to 40 dollars per share. And then overall, when you look at the AI revolution, it's, it's Palantir, front and center in terms of the use cases. This is just the start of a 1995 moment. I think tech, leg higher, we see 15% up the rest of the year. Okay, Palantir. Let's speak about Palantir, and then we'll get into Tesla, Apple, NVIDIA, those sorts of subjects. Okay, the stock has done nothing for the last two months or so, right? Two, two and a half months. You see the chart right there since kind of, you know, let's call it the beginning, middle of February there, right? So Palantir, is Palantir priming up for its next big move? The answer to that is absolutely, as long as Palantir comes in with phenomenal growth rates again. If they come in with another 70% plus growth rate on U.S. commercial, we're off to the races again. We're heading back up to 25 plus, okay? If, let's say, on top of that, the government numbers start showing very nice growth, which that's been a real weak spot for the company recently, then we're talking about, (laughs) watch out. If they come in, government looks great, and on top of that, they come in and the commercial business is... You know, growth rates are astronomical as they were last quarter for U.S. commercial. Oh, my gosh. Okay. We're we're going flying. Now, the third component is if, if, if international commercial also is finally waking up, which that's been dormant. If that wakes up, (laughs) you might see a 30. You might see a 30 handle on it. I'm not getting too excited about that because I'm not counting on international commercial to really be there. But if if the government business is coming in strong and we got U.S. commercial coming in ridiculously strong, which probably is going to play out, I think we're headed back to 25 plus, right? Obviously, if the numbers came in super disappointing, then we're going under 20. But I'm feeling a little bullish in regards to that whole situation, okay? Next one up here, Tesla and Apple. Go. Today is a clear example of it. Deirdre Bosa joining us now with a look at why it's not just the stock decline that each of these two tech darlings have in common right now, Deirdre. That's right. Good morning, Sarah. So it's time we should maybe start thinking about the Fantastic Five. It was the Fabulous Four for a little bit as well. But Google has really made its way back into the mega cap winners with its 12% rise over the past month. And that leaves Apple and Tesla still out of the group. Today's performance from both those names underscoring that new dynamic. Shares of Tesla, they are sinking after laying off 10% of its workforce. And shares of Apple, they're also dipping on reports of weak iPhone shipments. Zoom out, the bifurcation is even more pronounced though. They're the only two that are still in the red for the year. And it is not just that stock decline that they have in common. There are a surprising number of fundamental parallels between the two. Both companies facing increased competition from China. That is hitting top line growth. For Tesla, it's new, Xpeng, BYD, among others. Today's layoffs, they're in response to that. Falling sales, price wars, and the share decline today. It suggests that Wall Street is seeing... Come on, Neo? You gonna mention Neo in there? Come on. Neo's under four bucks a share. Come on now. As a response to shrinking business rather than push BYD's for efficiency fair. that has helped push other mega caps higher in terms of their stock price. Meanwhile, new numbers from IDC this morning, they show that Apple's global market share of smartphones, they're giving up ground to Chinese players as well. They're Xiaomi, sure. Transion, yeah. Oppo, Huawei as well. It's a combo of soft sales from the latest iPhone model last September and Beijing's ban on foreign devices in the workplace. Now, another thing that Apple and Tesla have in common, both have reportedly killed major projects. There's Tesla's mass market car, Apple's own attempt at a car. Musk has denied that report. Apple hasn't commented. And in this kind of fascinating link, guys, to both of them, Xiaomi, One of the top Chinese smartphone players launched an EV last week doing something that sort of confronts both those names. On the flip side, they both have opportunities on the horizon to win investors back. And people don't understand the the chess game that Tesla's playing. I'll explain in just a moment. Okay. Stakes are high. Apple's chance will come first on June 10th with its annual developers event. AI will take center stage there. Tesla's catalyst could be in August with its robo-taxi reveal, which Morgan Stanley says could set the tone for 23 2030, excuse me, and beyond. Now, Musk has promised robo-taxis for years, though, and Apple may be playing catch-up in AI and have to prove that this is going to be more than just an AI upgrade cycle. In both those cases, though, guys, the stakes are high, and they've set the bar high for themselves after a period of, let's call it, underperformance. 
So uh, people do not understand the, the, the chess game that's going on for Tesla right now. Musk and the team's thinking years ahead, okay? Let me break this down as simple as I possibly can, okay? First off, the whole oh, Tesla doesn't want to make any cheaper vehicles. Baloney. That doesn't make any sense. Of course they do. They, they want to come out with a model that the masses, the masses, masses can afford. Like everybody in the middle class can afford that vehicle, right? Something under 30K, boom. I mean, it's going to be ridiculous in terms of the volumes they can move there, right? Now, why would Tesla want to sell a ridiculous amount of those sorts of vehicles? Let's say it goes into production 2026, which I think is pretty realistic. There's been talk about 2025. Let's say it's 2026, that vehicle goes into production. Why would Tesla want to move a huge amount of units? People might think, well, it's just a lot more revenue, right? A lot more profits. No, something much bigger going on here, okay? Tesla wants to move that many units. So at the end of the day, robo taxi opportunity, right? Which if you are experiencing FSD, the new version, I mean, I can only imagine where FSD is going to be a year from now, two years from now. The, I'm fully confident that in 2026, these cars will drive a million times better than a human. Like it's not even going to be remotely close, okay? So you're looking at a situation here that Tesla could say, okay, let's build out all the vehicles for the robo taxi fleet, or we can remain more asset light. The people can buy the cars, right? And then those same people can manage the fleet, can have their cars drive around and make them money when they're not using them, right? Which most of the time people aren't even using their cars. They're just sitting around. Like the far majority of people don't even use their cars hardly at all. Like of, of you know, let's say over a given week, how much, how much time do you actually use your car? Maybe a few hours, maybe a few hours you actually use your car. And that was, that's a majority of people out there, right? Out of an entire week, 24 hours a day times seven, and you're using it for maybe a few hours each week, maybe five, 10 hours, something like that. So your car's just sitting there idly for all that other time. Why not make money from that, right? Now Tesla could say, okay, let's just make all the cars and let's have all our cars, Tesla cars, robo taxi, and we'll make all the money. Sure. But then you're going asset heavy. Now you got to come out of pocket $20,000 per car. Let's say that's the production cost of the robo taxi type car, right? Versus you could have somebody else buy that car for, let's say, $25,000, $27,000, $29,000, something like that, right? Then you take a fee off that whenever it's being used for ro the robo-taxi opportunity, right? They're the ones that manage it. They're the ones that got to worry about keeping the cars clean and keeping them in good shape. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about managing the fleet. You're just taking a fee off of all that, right? Which keeps you much more asset light rather than asset heavy. And instead of having billions of dollars or tens of billions of dollars of your own robo taxis out there, then you've got to worry about cleaning them and keeping them charged and all that stuff. Instead, those cars are managed by other people. You don't have to deal with any of that crap, right? So that's a game of ch chess that uh, you know Tesla's playing here. Now, in regards to Tesla, is a stock a buy? Absolutely, as long as you got a long-term vision, right? If you're hoping Tesla's going to be 200 tomorrow, you know <laughs> it might not be the stock for you. But as long as you got a long-term vision here and you're you're playing for what this opportunity is over this next five, 10 years, yes, it's a buy here. In terms of Apple, you know, it's funny because I've been negative on Apple for quite some time, and I'm actually starting to turn more positive on Apple. And the reason being is. They've been losing market share, and there's a whole, you know, bad kind of sentiment around Apple right now. They've gotten very lucky that big tech's done well while they've been doing bad. But in regards to Apple, I'm actually bullish on Apple for 2025, 2026, and I'll tell you why. They're coming out with a bigger iPhone. It's like 99% sure they're going to come out with a bigger iPhone next year. And because of that, I think units are going to increase dramatically. And I think market share in China could actually reverse in 2025. We know the Chinese love big iPhones, right? As Americans do, almost everybody does. And so don't be surprised if there's a new excitement around Apple next year, right? Not this year. It's a down and out year for Apple, kind of like Tesla. But next year and beyond, I think things could get actually much better. So, you know, I do not own any Apple shares right now, but I'm actually turning more bullish on Apple for 2025 and beyond. In NVIDIA, let's talk NVIDIA and if this stock's an opportunity. Aria joins us now, maintains a buy rating on NVIDIA, price target of $1,100. So, Vivek, do you see this as Ooh, just nine hours left to folks. cool down? Nine hours left. Pin comment. Nine yeah, I think, hours Sarah, left. This is uh, the ninth or tenth time in the last two years we have seen NVIDIA stock uh, have a 10% or so correction. And every time it has done that, it has uh, inevitably been a good opportunity to relook at the stock. Because... 
He's got a price target of $1,100 on NVIDIA stock. Obviously, considerable upside from here. We can call it, what, 250 bucks roughly? Fundamentally, what's happening is that we are going to have at least a four-plus year build-out of the AI uh, deployment infrastructure mm, that's important. across cloud four service years. providers, across enterprises. Yes. Four-plus year build-out. The last year was a first year, so we're in the second year. So that means... NVIDIA stock has at least another year to run, if not two years, before, let's call the next big down cycle for NVIDIA. That's very important. The second year of those four years, so anyone who is you know, trying to call this as a peak, in my view, is being too premature. So the size of the opportunity is growing. It can be 250 to 500 billion annually. We are still less than 100 billion of that. So size of the opportunity is growing. Second is their pipeline is extremely strong. Today, a lot of the AI infrastructure has been built on a product that they conceived it during the COVID time. You know, generative AI was not even a thing at that time. It's really the new product Blackwell that is coming out that we think is really custom designed for generative AI and that we just start shipping in another quarter. So larger opportunity size, a much stronger pipeline. And then the third and most important thing is valuation. We think NVIDIA is the cheapest large cap uh, growth stock in our uh, coverage. It's selling for under 30 times for an earnings growth rate, which is 40% plus, right? The S&P 500 is trading at two times price to earnings growth ratio, and Midi has less than one time. So we think increasing size of opportunity, better pipeline, and a very compelling uh, valuation, and volatility is just, you know, part of the game here. Wonder if investors are worried at all about competition. Vivek, we got that news yesterday from Google announcing its, its own sort of ARM-designed CPU chip. Is that a... Is that a threat here to names like NVIDIA? Yeah, I think competition is going to be there uh, since uh, the AI market started. We have seen custom chips uh, account for about 10 to 15 percent. NVIDIA has consistently managed to keep 75 to 80 percent. And we have seen nothing that uh, changes that uh, view. Uh, Google has been designing their internal chips, actually designing in collaboration with Broadcom since 2017. And since 2017 to now, NVIDIA's data center business has probably grown 20 to 30 times. So Google designing their own chips, I, I don't think is, is anything extraordinary. In fact, the CPU part that they are designing, CPU is something that uh, NVIDIA doesn't even sell to them. So I don't think that CPU announcement really should have been, had any implication on NVIDIA. The other interesting thing that I think sometimes gets... 100%. Just people don't really understand how these markets work. They just hear a headline like, oh, so, oh, bye, uh forgotten is that if you look at who is ahead in terms of monetizing generative AI and large language models, it's companies such as OpenAI, Microsoft, Meta. And if you look at who has been the largest adopter of NVIDIA chips rather than custom chips, it's OpenAI, Microsoft, and Meta versus others who have relied more on internal chips. So is, it, is that just a co coincidence or is that really a correlation between the faster adoption of NVIDIA products and the success that these uh, customers are seeing in uh, the monetization of their generative AI uh, infrastructures. So what? But so, do you think that their hyperscaler partners, the ones that are spending all this money on AI, will be able to go elsewhere to another competitor or develop their own like Google's doing? Yeah, I think that we will continue to have this uh, mix because there is just a wide range of workloads, right? Uh, uh, the large cloud companies have internal workloads, you know, for example, search, you know, monetization of their video uh, infrastructure. But then they also have public cloud workloads, which are faster, which are growing. That is where enterprises are working with them to set up their own uh, uh, generative AI training and, and inference. And that's the part that NVIDIA does extremely well because it has this really large base of deployed hardware uh, based on their CUDA uh, operating system. And that is what incentivizes enterprises to come and ask for NVIDIA-based hardware when they come to these uh, public clouds. But I think the big picture view is that accelerators is a hundred billion dollar market. We think it doubles in the next uh, three years at least. And in that, NVIDIA maintains 75, 80% market share. And we think that the rest of the industry will have 20, 25% uh, market share. So there will be a range of choices, but I do think that it's a large and fast growing market and NVIDIA's competitive position is getting better. So is NVIDIA stock a buy? Let me show you something very important. So, is NVIDIA stock a buy? The answer is yes, absolutely. And the reason being, you look at the Ford P on the stock, right? It's 1000X, obviously you guys don't have uh, access to this. This is my own uh, tool and software I've been building now for quite a while now at this point in time. But, you know, you look at the Ford P of the stock, we're at 37. 
first off, that's taking all analysts kind of, you know, what they're expecting here for the company to have for EPS, which analysts have been incredibly wrong on NVIDIA and they're likely way too bearish. NVIDIA's reality forward P is probably at 31 or 33 right now, right? So higher than most stocks traded in the market, but the stocks, I mean, the company's also probably going to grow 10x or over 10x, the revenue growth of, let's call it, you know, companies that are also competing, you know, with NVIDIA, or let's just call it companies in the stock market in general, right? So it should be trading at, I mean, you can make an argument that it should be trading at at least minimum of 5x on a forward P basis, what an average stock is trading at in the market, right? And when you think about it from the context of these cycles, and I've explained this, you know, in many videos in the past in regards to NVIDIA, these type of chip cycles, these super cycles, these usually last for three to five years, right? You heard that gentleman right there talking about this is a four-year cycle. We're in year two of that cycle, year two. So we have a bit to go here in regards to this kind of super cycle, and you don't actually know where the top is. The top will probably be hit in the next two or three years, but we don't know where that top is. And so from this standpoint, and we also don't know what products NVIDIA is going to come out with over the next two to three years, it's going to give them the next layer of growth and next layer of growth. And we also know NVIDIA is about, just about, to start making bank from software, right? And that's going to be a business that grows substantially over the next two to three years from a business that is nothing to actually a substantial business probably three years out. And so therefore, NVIDIA still has a long runway of growth. I've been telling people this. I believe it, people are going to be paying a thousand bucks for NVIDIA very shortly here. Then they're going to be 12, paying twelve hundred, and then ultimately they're going to be paying fifteen hundred for the stock. And it's not like that far into the future when they're going to be paying these prices. So, you know, it's always possible NVIDIA lays an egg and the business starts to decline or something like that. But it just it doesn't look practical. It doesn't look like it makes sense. Remember who's NVIDIA's customers? They're the biggest, strongest tech companies in the world, and all those companies have already kind of given their budgets, and they're all allocating a lot more toward these sorts of chips from NVIDIA. So are they going to magically not have the money to pay NVIDIA for these chips? No. Are they stuck having to get these NVIDIA chips? Yes. Why? The reason being is they, all their competitors are doing it. If you want to get behind all your competitors, then don't buy these NVIDIA chips. You want to stay above your competition or at least with them? You've got to get these NVIDIA chips. You have no choice. It's not like you can be like, oh, let's just skip that. Skip it. And then fall behind all your competitors and you'll be out as a CEO and the board of directors is going to vote you out. You have no choice, okay? All right, next one here. Let's get into the IRS. Danny Warfel, good morning to you. Um, good morning. I was asking if you were watching the, the Masters over the weekend. You said you, it's a busy weekend for the IRS. It is. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a busy weekend for everybody else who's trying to get their tax materials completed. It's a busy weekend for you because... Well, because a lot of the returns come in uh, over the weekend, over the weekend and today uh, on a day like today, uh, April 15th, we might see a million returns come in every hour. And at this point, it's really making sure that our technology right. can handle the load. And so far, so good. And you were saying how many how many filings an hour? A million. A million an hour. Yeah. On April 15th. Yep. Can I ask a terrible question, please? And I've been that guy. I've gone down to the the uh, uh, the, the mail the, the post, post office down here on 34th Street because it's still open to like midnight, <laughs> you know, on, on the 15th. Yes. Just so I get the postmark. Yes. If I got the postmark tomorrow, what would happen? You potentially would get a late filing penalty fee. or fee. Yes. But here's what is, I'm going to tell you to do. Is there a grace period or not? Here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Yeah. Don't walk down to the post office. File electronically. <laughs> right. Select direct deposit, and we will get your, your refund in under 21 days. And here's something that a lot of taxpayers don't realize. It's a refund. If Two out of every three taxpayers that are going to file by tonight's deadline are actually owed a refund. And so it's in your interest to, uh, to, to get your taxes done right? because two out of three of you, we're going to pay you. Okay. All right, so here's a few tax tips for everybody out there, okay? Uh, one, if you own a business, okay, before you ever file your taxes, go back through your main credit card that you use all your business expenses on and make sure everything is, you know, that's calculated as a business expense is calculated as a business expense, right? People miss stuff and you might have spent 200 bucks on this over here, or $500 on this, and you didn't categorize it as a business expense. And so you just missed an opportunity, right? A $500 deduction off your taxes. So that's a big tip. Another big tip for all, all investors out there is 
you know, when you're going to sell stocks, try to sell them for long-term gains. You're going to either probably pay 0% on long-term capital gains, depending upon where your tax bracket is, or 15%. Let's just call it somewhere in there roughly, right? Versus if you take short-term gains on stocks, so for less than a year, you're going to have to be taxed at your normal tax rate. And most people watching this video right now, you're going to be taxed at your normal tax rate somewhere in the 20 to 35% range, right? So we're talking about a substantial difference there in terms of how much money you get to keep in your pocket. So I think that's just another little tip that everybody needs out there, okay? All right, guys, appreciate you joining me as always. The sale is almost over, uh, nine hours until it's over. Pin comment down there if you want to access that right before it ends. Probably won't do another deal on this tier for who knows when. Maybe Black Friday. I don't even know if we'll do it then. We'll see. Um, but anyways, yeah, pin comment down there to get access to my highest Patreon tier. Much love and have a great day.